Starliner Media. Starliner Media presents Music Night at the Majestic with your host, Michael Boswell. All right, it's time once again for Music Night at the Majestic. And with us tonight, Roger Earl of Fog Hat. Roger, welcome to the show. How you doing, Michael? Nice to uh, see you. <laughs> it's good to be seen as well. Uh, how are you? You're in Chicago, right? Exactly. So, in, in, uh, where are you today? I'm in Long Island, New York. I'm at home. Um, it's a cloudy day. It's windy, but I live in a little piece of heaven on earth, so... Um, and I have a, I had Sunday off, which was great. I had a Sunday with um, the girlfriend and the wife. It was great. <laughs> they are one of the same. <laughs> <laughs> Always a plus. Yeah. Well, then, uh, the, the rest of the week, she's the manager. So um, <laughs> I have to leave her alone unless it's something to concern being, uh, hey, unless it's concerning... Sonic Mojo. <laughs> the brand new album that you guys yeah. have out. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm really excited about it. You know, it's the first time Fog ha ever had a number one of anything. This is number one on the, or was number one on the uh, Billboard Blues charts. And it was, uh, you know, we've had um, some certain degrees of success throughout um, our 50 odd year career. But we never had had a number one of anything, which was kind of funny. So we all sort of celebrated and drank some wine and had a good time. Um, I'm really proud of this record. And it was a lot of fun making it. And also, we did a couple of record release parties, which we've done once or twice before. But we basically played the whole album live, which, oh, I, in my opinion, is particularly brave. <laughs> <laughs> Well, to tell you uh, on the new record, and yeah. we'll, we'll we'll get into it. Uh, what I one of the things I like is you know Fogat's always had cover versions on the on the albums. This time around, you've got a couple of them that are really interesting. One in particular, so you know, at least from my perspective. What one's that? Rodney Crowell's song for the life. <laughs> now, how right. did you guys come to pick that? There is a story to it about. Eight or nine years ago, something like that, uh, myself and, and Linda, my girlfriend, uh, wife and manager, <laughs> she, we're driving down to Nashville to see, uh, stay with some friends for a couple of days. And this song comes on the radio and it says, I don't drink as much as I ought to in this sort of, and I go, what a great line. And uh, it took me years to, and I would Google it and, said does anybody know where this song it's like because and then it cut out uh and then eventually i found that it was a rodney crowell song and we did a rodney crowell song on um in the move of something rude another uh when did you do that 82 i think that album came out and we did um ain't living long like this uh mm -hmm. because uh eric cartwright and dave peverett were big fans of uh, rodney anyway I got I got um, the song downloaded and I listened to Rodney's version and of course it's like a, it's a you know really nice country like you know three four time ballad and I and I'm hanging out with Scott Holt our lead singer and guitar player and I'm saying I don't know this is going to work for Foghat so <laughs> <laughs> no. no but playing it like you know but also like doing it the same as rodney was i mean he he's such a great singer and songwriter i mean he's made so many incredible written so many incredible songs anyway we worked on it and then one night about two or three in the morning um we'd finished rehearsing for the day and, and like working on stuff and i'm sitting there with my practice pad in the studio and scott's always got his guitar with him all of a sudden we start playing something okay hold on a second, that will work. And then we go, all right. And then I get on the drums and Scott plugs in his amp and all of a sudden we got the idea for the arrangement. Uh, we recorded it the next morning when, when Brian got to the studio. But um, 
and my manager also knew Rodney's manager, uh, who old manager who knew his new manager. Anyway, <laughs> they, uh, they got in touch with Rodney and just told him that, you know, we're going to do one of his songs. And uh, I called him up and left a message for him. And he called me back and uh, we talked. And rumor has it that he told one of his people that the first time we did one of his songs, which was Ain't Living Long Like This, which we're also going to try and put in the set. But our set is already up to about an hour and 50 minutes. So we're going to have to make some room for it. And uh, it was, and, and he called me back and uh, and he and he said, you know, it's, it was really cool. And we talked for a while. And I was down in Nashville, uh, sorry, Columbia, Tennessee at the time. He was going to try and get over and see us, but he, was, he got busy. I mean, he's out on the road touring. But um, it was great to talk to him. I don't know if he's heard our latest version that we've done to his beautiful song. <laughs> but it's um, a song for life. It's, I love the lyrics on it. It, it was so uh, it's really you know though it, you know the the, the 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 line i don't drink as much as i ought to but it's really a song about how you found yourself sort of later in life which actually was uh much closer to how i feel at the moment so uh yeah rodney crow uh he's uh, as far as i'm concerned he's um an american hero and uh he's we, he's a He's a hero, musical hero. Um, I'm a big Johnny Cash fan. So I grew up listening to Johnny Cash when I was uh, about 12 years old, riding my bike to school. My older brother, Colin, who was four years older than me, used to buy a bunch of his records. And they were all like uh, early son records, you know, Jerry D. Lewis and uh, Johnny Cash was on. Even though Johnny Cash didn't have a drummer on his early records, there was always this fantastic rhythm and stories i i don't think a a 12 year old boy from southwest london really understood some of the lyrics i didn't actually but i loved the fact there was always this terrific rhythm going through it and there was always a, a story so yeah i'm a big johnny cash fan Ooh, i come from the thames delta <laughs> <laughs> now tell, tell tell me this who are some of your other big musical influences uh, let's see. Well, the first one would be Jerry D. Lewis. Um, my father took me to see him when I was 12 years old in a theater in Southwest London. And, uh, my mother said I was never the same after that, which is true. Um, and I, I knew I wanted to do, I wanted to be in a rock and roll band. I started playing piano to start off with, but my older brother, Colin was playing. My father played piano and, um, I was always banging on stuff in the house, you know, knives and forks on the good china. You know, the ride symbol would be a lampshade, you know. Um, uh, so I started taking lessons when I was about 12, about that year. Uh, my father found uh, a friend of his that he worked with, was also a drum teacher, jazz player, really good drummer. Uh, Chris Hayes is his name. Uh, he also taught a number of other well-known drummers. Uh, the Kinks drummer, I think, studied under him. Um, then by the time I was 15, I'd saved up, you know, half the money for my first drum kit because I worked three days a week after school. And Saturday mornings, I worked in a bakery. Saturday afternoons, I had my drum lesson, which was an hour. Um, then by the time I was 15, I thought I knew it all. Typical teenager. <laughs> and... Uh, yeah um I, I was real fortunate i had great parents um they never beat me though i'm sure i deserved it once or twice um never went hungry we weren't rich by any stretch of the imagination uh, it was a semi-detached no it was a detached house uh in uh, hounslow southwest london but there was always music in the house my dad played piano mum sang dad sang a bit too um any musical thing that came on the radio or on TV, we were watching it and it would be on and turned up as loud as it would go. Um, so I grew, and my uh, grandmother, uh, my father's side, um, that was the first record player I ever worked on. It was one of those things, you know, with the big uh, you know, RCA dog on it and so The Victrola. The Victrola. Um, you know, you had to put needles in. To, it was, 
and that was when I was really young, like five or six years older, maybe younger. So I grew up in uh, surrounded by music, and it seemed like a natural thing. And something about that, you know, drummers. Um, there are some people that can play everything, and uh, I, I hate those people. Don't you hate people like that? <laughs> you know, as me, a mortal struggle with one instrument, um, but the drums it was like an instant thing for me like playing uh but i really wanted to play in a band it's it's okay sitting and practicing and doing your paradiddles and flams and stuff but uh i must admit when i first started playing i couldn't figure out uh how i would um put my not my rudimental knowledge into playing it didn't it didn't seem to work uh i've since figured out that it was uh, a good idea that I did, in fact, have a teacher stop me from getting into any nasty habits. I have had a few nasty habits over the years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, yeah, um, that was the start of my uh, musical career. Um, I always wanted to play in a band. Drums were great, but playing in a band is what it's all about. Yeah. Now, how did you come to join Savoy Brown? Luck. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was, I, I first, first band I was in, I was about 16 or 17. It was uh, three guys that I grew up with and went to school with. Um, my best friend, Dave Hutchins, played bass. Ray Dorsett, who played, sang and played guitar, who uh, went on to be Mungo Jerry. Um, and the other guitar player was Dick Howe. I don't know what happened to him. But um, they started when they were about 10 years old. They were playing. I, you know, I didn't get a drum kit till I was 15. And I joined them then. They were called the Tramps in uh, Staines, Egham area, southwest London. And uh, Savoy Brown, uh, Dave, myself, and Ray Dorsett were in a band called we had so many different names anyway we were a three-piece and everything had started slowing down this was around 1967 um we weren't getting much work and i found an ad in the melody maker which is a, a london a music musical rag was at the time and uh said bass player and drummer wanted for blues band so myself and dave uh went there I didn't get the job the first time um and they were with the same agency that our band was with. Um, and they called me up about a month or so later and said, would you like to come and try again? And I said, they just needed a drummer this time. So I went along, it was at lunchtime. I was working in London as a commercial artist at the time. So I borrowed dad's car. So I had my, I could bring the drums in. Uh, it was in a place called um, the Nags Head. Yeah, it was in, Battersea, southwest London, South London, and uh, took the drums up the stairs. It was a blues club at the time as well, um, and played for probably over two, well over two hours. Um, and I, I, you know, thought it went well. Um, you know, they, they were a really good band. Lonesome Dave, uh, Chris Jordan, of course, Kim Simmons, who I, I, I became real good friends with over the years. Um, so um, then it was sort of time they started packing up equipment so i started packing up my drums and was about to take them down the stairs and they said uh, where are you going i said uh going back to work i have a desk job they said playing in birmingham tonight <laughs> so uh that was that was my the start of my introduction to uh, savoy brown and i gotta tell you it was um i had a really really good time playing in that band um it uh the really cool thing i think for me in, in reflection is that i i pre i had a free hand with what i wanted to do um you know chris was the main songwriter dave of course wrote some stuff and kim simmons did of course but we would rehearse um at various places around london and uh then we would go in the studio and it, everything was one take back then it was the first time I was really in the studio, a real studio anyway. And uh, I was never told what to do. Um, or it was always like, that's good, Rog. Or, you know, or like, 
I'd listen to Chris, I always listen to the lead, the vocals and the lyrics. And um, obviously, Kim's playing was absolutely fantastic. And Dave, Dave and I sort of connected as well. In fact, I might have got the job because of Dave, I think, on reflection, because he said uh, after the first audition, the second, uh, the second time I came, the first drummer they got uh, didn't work out, apparently. And Dave said, what about that bloke with the image? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, it worked out great. Um, it was a lot of fun. And, uh, and Kim and I remained friends throughout the years. Yeah, tell, tell me this, Roger. Uh, you mentioned being a commercial artist. If the, the music career hadn't panned out, is that the direction you think you would have gone? No, hate is like horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me how you really feel. That, um, actually, the people I work with are fantastic. Um, I started doing that when I, I left home when I was 15. Um, I was a junior artist um, in London, uh, basically a glorified coffee and tea boy. But I, I, I was good at it. I mean, I, uh, I actually went back to night school for to brush up on my math, but um, uh, I was good at it and, and it was easy. It was basically, I would, um, there was some industrial, some design, you know, uh, uh, in, uh, for uh, like boxes and stuff, cornflake boxes and stuff like that. But basically I would do the artwork for the printers. So it was really, you know, black and white lines and drawing. Occasionally I'd have something exciting to do, like some airbrushing and photo retouching, but um no my all i wanted to do was play in fact the last job i was in when i was, I was probably about 19 that was when uh things up until then i it had been most of my days would be on the weekend so i was okay but all of a sudden when i joined savoy brown and i still kept my day job barely <laughs> they were very understanding and uh it was um I was always on the phone, you know, they would call me up and go uh, and tell me where to be and like something was going on. And of course, you know, uh, you know, Thursday night we'd be playing in Newcastle and I had to drive back down to London. I had to go into work Monday, Friday morning and I'd look like something the cat dragged in or worse. <laughs> and I'd say, oh, so, sorry, I'm like, you know, the bus and the trains. And they said, where'd you play last night, Rog? Newcastle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they knew where um, I wanted to be, and they were very tolerant. I have to say that. Uh, I think uh, any lesser uh, company would have fired me in a heartbeat. You don't really <laughs> want to be here, do you? Uh, Some place I'd rather be, but I'm here now. <laughs> it was um, it was a good way to earn a living. It was up in London, uh, you know where all the clubs were and all, really where everything is actually happening and going on at the time, you know, it was a great time actually to be around for me anyway. Um, you know, the, the bands that you go and see, you know, the Stones, the Yardbirds, Cyril Davis's Rhythm and Blues, All Stars, um, Stones, of course, I said that one already, the Stones twice, actually. <laughs> uh, the Who, um, it was, um, it was a great place. It was a great time to grow up. Uh, grow up? Um, I haven't right. grown up yet. No. My, my, <laughs> <laughs> my, I was going to say, you need to take a few steps towards adulthood. Yeah. Well, actually, my, my wife says I sometimes act like a 16-year-old. I said, no, I don't. I act more like a 21-year-old. I got laid more then. <laughs> <laughs> One has to keep one's sense of humor. Yeah, absolutely. Well, tell me this, uh, at what point or what was the uh, impetus for you guys leaving Savoy Brown to form Foghat? Um, really, it was just time for a change. The band was doing great, Nineteen end of 1970. Um, Harry Simmons and Kim sat us down. Uh, we, were in, um, we were in San Francisco. And we played there and we had a couple of days off there. And uh, uh, they fired Tony Stevens and they said to Dave and myself that we could 
stay on if we wanted to so uh so, okay uh dave and i and tony went back to my hotel room and um Dave had an acoustic guitar. I had my pad and Tony was there as well. And we we played for the first time Fool's Hall of Fame, which was a song went on our first album, Foghat album. And Dave and I talked there. Dave was a little reluctant to leave, I think, would he, you know, because it was the band was doing great. We weren't really getting paid much at all. Then we never got paid for recording or anything like that. Um but the band was earning between seven and maybe fifteen thousand dollars a night which is a lot of money back in 1970-71 um and we were having a really good time i mean actually somebody told me once i'd probably have a good time in a box i'll find out one day (laughs) (laughs) um anyway dave and i had breakfast with the manager harry the next morning and we told him that we were going to leave, but we would stay as long as Kim needed us and, you know, and playing whatever he wanted. Um, uh, but, you know, we think we'd all, we'd all try something else. Uh, he told us at the time that we would never work in the States, we would never work in England again, and that he would blackball us with everybody. What a piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> and how well, unprophetic. And, and true to his word, he did. He uh, blackballed us. And we struggled very hard. Well, we didn't get any work. We did a, maybe a couple of local gigs where we were living in uh, out in Oxfordshire, in a town called Wallingford. Uh, that's another story. We'll get there if you want. <laughs> Go for it. All right. Uh, well, we left the band. I went to see um, Terry Ellis and, and Chris Wright, who were the owners of... Um, Savoy Brown's agency, Chrysalis, and and I knew them, and they lived uh, within 10 miles of where Dave and I were living at the time in Oxfordshire, and um, I went to see them, and they said, we can't, we can't book you, Harry threatened to take Chicken Shack and Savoy Brown away from them if they booked us, which is, you know, pretty shitty, actually, but, um, you know, I mean, we, we were just like, three musicians and harry was a manager of, of two of the most uh, certainly popular bands and he was also an agent so uh anyway that was sort of where that happened and um we start uh actually uh next what happens is we'd left and uh we'd, we start rehearsing we start looking for uh uh, a, a keyboard player or a guitar player. Uh, we auditioned some keyboard players, and then I audition, we auditioned some guitar players in up in Islington, which is in North London. And uh, we rented a pub for a couple of days, and some really good guitar players turned up. But um, Rob Price, Rob Price turned up on the second day, and Dave, I think, had met him. Dave. Uh, Rob played in a band called uh, the Black Cat Bones, and I think David jammed with him a couple of times. But when Rod pulled out his slide and started playing, <laughs> I remember Dave and I looking at each other again. It was like, really? <laughs> um, so after that, uh, we went into the pub next door, which is what you do. And... <laughs> um i asked rod if he wanted to be in the band which he did he was wasn't really working he worked driving a wine truck delivering wine uh, you want to join a band <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah rob, rob was uh an incredible guitar player and um huge part of uh who fog happy came I, uh, that's the truth he was absolutely brilliant but later on, uh, <clears throat> I think he found it difficult being on the road, whereas myself and Dave, um, you, we ate, slept and breathed being on the road and playing. Um, Rod struggled with um, a number of issues, but the main thing was, it was, I think, just the touring. And when you're pl- uh, pl- he was playing at such a, a very intense level, 
but there again, that's because that's his own fault for being that good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the perils of talent. Yeah. Um, uh, and it just got too much for him. But And so he left in 1980, 81, he left the band. But he was a huge part of this band. Uh, the way he played, it was uh, a sad day when we lost him. But, hey, things change, right? Yep. Well, tell, tell me this. How did you guys wind up on Bearsville? And then on that first album, how did Dave Edmonds end up producing the LP? Held a gun to his head. No. <laughs> That'll work. No, 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 no. They have to have guns over there. Um, <laughs> when we we uh, when, after we left Savoy Brown, we spent some time, um, obviously, you know, rehearsing and working on stuff. We'd uh, we'd actually got paid really well from our last tour with Savoy Brown. We'd never got we'd never seen this sort of money before. I think we got like three thousand pounds or four thousand pounds which was a lot of money at the time we were earning uh 60 bucks a week so that was a huge amount of money uh you know they Savoy brand was making incredible money and i think there was a tax situation where they had they had to pay us also it was some kind of severance i think um anyway uh we did get paid um uh, and that's how we survived for the first year and a half i'd met this guy called Tony O'Teed and we became friends uh, when we were in we're on our first tour and second tour of uh, with Savoy Brown and I went and uh, he lived out on Long Island and I happened to mention that I liked to fish and he said you ever caught a striped bass or a blue fish and I said no he said you want to come and stay at my parents house and catch some and I said yes please <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was the start of our friendship and it was a, a good friendship and uh he went to see savoy brown when they came back uh, yeah, over here in probably 1972 and uh of course myself and dave and tony stevens weren't there and so he called me up in england and said what's going on and said well we uh, we left savoy brown and we're putting a band together he borrowed some money from his dad and came over and told us he wanted to be our manager he was he'd, he'd never been a manager before but um he has some really good ideas and also i think the truth is that he'd applied for a job i don't know the details of it for to albert grossman who was stuck putting together a new uh uh label bearsville records and um I, th I think Paul Fishkin actually got the job, but I think Albert Grossman remembered Tony and Tony had talked to Albert Grossman. Um, by this time, we'd made a six song demo at uh, Abbey Road. Um, the songs actually made it onto the first record, but I don't think we were, well, no, I know we weren't really um, producers and engineers, but. I think it got the, the gist of it. Anyway, Albert Grossman was coming over to London, to uh, the UK rather, and uh, with the band which, who he managed. Todd Rongram was with him. And uh, again, we rented uh, a pub in Islington, Northwest London. And uh, Albert came down to see us. Um, it was a smelly, sweaty pub and uh it was just albert it was uh, about lunchtime about midday and uh we played six or seven songs we did our high watts and marshall's blasting he visibly went <laughs> <laughs> when we started playing because he was only about 15 feet away from the, the stage anyway um i still get chills when i tell of his story uh, which i've told numerous times um so we finished playing and albert is he used, to, he used to do this thing, sort of thing, right? Uh, so he said, uh, and he had this huge mop of like silver hair turned in a ponytail. Very impressive man. And he said, well, uh, hey, uh, well, where can we get some tea and biscuits? And I said, well, there's a, a hotel across the road and, uh, you know, we can go there. So we went over there and ordered tea and biscuits. 
we sat around in a circle, the, the band members and Tony O.T., our man, uh, manager at the time, and Albert. And uh, tea and biscuits arrived, and I think I poured the tea in, and everybody was like waiting. And Albert, Albert said, well, uh, this, is, this is the part when I get chills. He says, well, uh, hey, let's do it. <laughs> and, it <laughs> and it was like, um, that's what he did. Um, he decided we were, he must have heard something he liked. Um, but the, uh, the introdu introduction to, to Albert was through uh, our manager, Tony Otida, because apparently all the other major record companies or miners too, had turned us down when they'd listened to the uh, six song demo we had. That's what our manager told us at the time. But going with uh, Albert and Bearsville was um, was the right thing. Uh, she was the only option. <laughs> 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 but uh, it was a good relationship. We made uh, made a bunch of really good records. Um, we made. Um, Bears, we made, we made Bearsville records. Uh, we sold millions of records, and Albert made millions of dollars on it. But, and it was um, mutually successful. Also, Albert, um, he supported the band in, in a number of ways. It was probably for our uh, royalty monies anyway, but he did, especially the, when a the, third album, Energized, we released that. I think it was Energized, but they really put a push on it. And... Um, uh i lived up in bearsville for a while when i first sort of came to the, to the states in 73 and uh you know i got to know albert a little better i would go and eat around there at his restaurants and uh i go went to his house a number of times he let me uh he lent me his couple of his fly rods a few times till i got my own and uh he was uh something else he was um he was impressed. I'll give a quick story. It doesn't really mean much, but uh, I, was, I was in his house one day and he's, he had three industrial sized refrigerators in his kitchen, big kitchen. It was, it, was half, it was like another person's house. Anyway, he opens one of the doors up and he, and he pulls a little jar or something out. And he says, uh, have, you, have you ever had any of this? And I go, no. He puts it back in there. <laughs> we went around to it. And then we go to the next one. He pulls something and says, Well, uh, you uh, ever heard any of this? And I go, No. Oh, he put it back in. Uh, yeah, he was um, he was a very interesting man. And uh, I think uh, Fogat is uh, very grateful. He was, he was, as far as I know, the only one that really said, Yeah, this band's got something. So uh, he was. Uh, he was something else. He really was. Yeah. Well, you mentioned energized. Yeah. How did you come to do the uh, cover of that'll be the day? Uh, well, Dave and I and Rod actually were big buddy Holly fans. Um, uh, we, I think how often these sort of, you know, like, uh, other, other people's songs come up, we were jamming in the studio and Dave started singing that. And, uh, we said, Oh, let's do that. In fact, that the same thing happens these days. Where you know we're in our studio down in the land, Florida. Uh, you know, Scott and I will just be playing, and uh, Scott will start singing a song and playing something, and I join in. And then we, afterwards, Brian probably pressed the record button, and uh, we go, "Wow, that sounds pretty good." Should we do? That? And that's that still stays with us. Uh, you know, just playing. Play, 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 play. We do the same thing at sound checks. We, uh, Scott just starts singing stuff, or I'll start playing something, and they put something together. It's, um, you know, I'm very fortunate. I actually earn a living doing this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'll tell you, man, uh, Roger. You, you mentioned fishing before. That, of course, leads me to the "Fool for the City" album cover. uh yeah um sunday morning we were in uh in manhattan down in the village uh st mark's place i think it was and uh nick jameson our producer and bass player at the time for the fall for the city album uh and still a really good friend um because of my penchant for fishing suggested this uh it was all his idea 
so one early so on sunday morning i don't think i'd had any sleep either um so it was we drive into the city um uh, the photographer and our manager pull up a manhole cover and i s sit there and you know they start taking pictures and then who should come along but two of new york's finest in their cruiser they wind down their window wind down windows and uh say hey you got a license we go oh shit yeah <laughs> you got a fishing license <laughs> and so they get out of the car they said what are you guys doing i said well you know and we it was explained what we were doing we were taking pictures for an album cover and they were really cool they ended you know made sure that nobody sort of went down the manhole cover and uh we took in tra took charge of like moving the cars along i took some pictures of them then carting me away and handcuffing me <laughs> you know new york cops are great um they were they were uh, they're more interested in like um murder and mayhem you know couple of people wanted to fish down a manhole cover yeah, that's cool <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, new york cops are great absolutely well i'll tell you talk about the album the, the title track what's the story behind that song fall for the city is uh dave wrote that but we were uh on a mountaintop in sharon vermont uh recording that album it was the first time we really take other than the first record that we'd taken deliberately took uh, like two or three months off to record nearly all the other albums except for the first one were all done like a week here two weeks here two weeks here um but we decided we wanted to spend some time on this one and nick had just joined the band as our bass player and producer tony stevens had left again <laughs> he was always leaving <laughs> uh, another story um i'm sure he's doing fine uh so um it was written about missing the city it's written all about new york city um because we were on the top of a mountain top in sharon vermont but we were a couple of hundred miles away maybe more than that and uh we locked ourselves up there we had we had a band house at the bottom of the hill mountain actually and uh we'd locked ourselves away for two or three months and uh, <clears throat> it worked. Um, Nick Jameson, our longtime producer and, and bass player at the time is absolutely brilliant. Um, I think I've said this before, but it bears repeating. If there's one single musician that I learned that I've worked with and known uh, that I learned a lot from, it was Nick Jameson. I learned a lot about, what to do in the studio how to do it what not to do uh, what to look for um and musically as well he's one of those people that can play anything and everything well do you hate people like that <laughs> well, of course <laughs> uh, um but we're still really good friends and in fact i saw him uh, just a month or so ago um it was his birthday but uh he was an incredible musician and um i think uh we owe nick jameson uh, a huge debt for that re record i don't think we'd been anywhere near as good had nick not joined the band and been the producer on that he also produced our uh, multi-platinum live record so he didn't play on that but uh uh yeah nick jameson absolute brilliant absolutely brilliant um he's uh a songwriter uh, an actor uh he does voiceovers he's living in iceland now in reykjavik um uh he loves it there and he plays in a blues band there and uh yeah he's a brother he's my brother by a different mother well i'd be remiss talking about <clears throat> about that album slow ride which you know is done okay <laughs> <laughs> you know one of the really cool things about another story, I go back a couple of last year, we played El Dorado, Arkansas. Now that's not El Dorado. There's pictures up all over the theater saying it's pronounced El Dorado. So, you know, we all practice that El Dorado. I don't know, it's something that went on that day. Anyway, we played there, terrific audience. And uh, it was the first time we played 
three songs from the new album. I don't think the album, I don't think the, maybe the album had just been released or escaped, uh, but they went down really well. And uh, after we finished the show, we, uh, Scott and I were back backstage and, you know, relaxing, having a glass of red wine. And uh, Scott says, isn't this, this great, Rog? He said, um, how many jobs are there out there where you finished working and people stand up and clap and cheer for you? <laughs> <laughs> and it kind of kind of puts it in spect uh, yeah in in perspective. Yes, it does. Um, you know, the thing is, I, I know how fortunate I am. I mean, I play not only do I play in a great band, I have a great job. So uh, yeah. People clap and cheer after you work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't get that working at the grocery store. Uh, no, 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 no. I'll tell you, 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 you mentioned the live album. Yeah, that was uh, that was an interesting time for us. The band I, th I, I know was playing particularly well at the time. I mean, uh, we'd been playing, you know, basically five years solid on the road. And um, our front of house engineer, uh, Bob Coffey, I'm still good friends with him, um, would give me cassettes every night and I'd play it on my boom box, my JVC boom box, just to see how we were doing, tempos, the way we were playing. And I remember saying to the band, you know, how, how great it's going. I mean, the, uh, other than <laughs> some youthful enthusiasm from the bass player and drummer um <laughs> i a little too fast uh the, the 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 band sounded great dave was singing great rob was playing brilliantly uh, dave was playing brilliantly but dave was a very underrated guitar player but there again there's so many great guitar players in the world he was noted for being a singer i think anyway um and uh, we decided to do a live record nick jameson was the producer we got the uh the rca uh recording unit uh and we did a number of shows uh it, the live album came from uh rochester and syracuse the M war memorial and i can't remember the name of the other building but um that's where the show came from it was only there's only six songs i think on the record and i know at the time we were playing for at least like an hour and 35 hour and 40 minutes um the rest of the album is sort of locked away somewhere in warner brothers vault i did talk to them a while ago about seeing if i could go down there and find it they said oh no you're not allowed down there nobody's allowed down there but how are we going to find it then <laughs> uh and they didn't want to talk to me anymore after that um but uh if ever that does come out um Nick Jameson will have to uh, mix it. Um, yeah, that was, uh, we were, um, when you're hot, you're not. And when you're not, we chop you off with the fucking knees. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'll tell you, tell you, Roger, the, uh, for the sake of time here, because there's a whole lot of, you know, uh, yeah, music yeah. between then and now. Let's, let's jump to the now with Sonic Mojo. Sonic Mojo. Um, I, I'm really, really pleased with this record. Um, it took us, uh, probably started, uh, you know, like six or seven years ago. Actually, our last studio album was um, Under the Influence, which which was, a, I think, a pretty good record too. We had a number of uh, friends on that. Uh, it was the last record, I think, that, um Craig played on some tracks and uh, Rodney O'Quinn joined the band on bass uh and um it was go it went really well I think and I invited Kim Simmons to come and play on it and I also invited Scott Holt to come and play on some of the songs which they did um we had a terrific producer Tom Hambridge uh though we recorded probably well over that uh, well over half the songs actually about two-thirds of those songs already down at our studio but um 
we wanted to give Brian a break, Brian Bassett a break from producing, engineering, and doing everything else. And uh, we figured Tom Hambridge would be the person to do it. But actually, it was a lot of fun working with Tom. Um, and we invited Kim down, and Scott Holt played on three or four tracks as well, four tracks, and sang on a couple of tracks as well. And after we'd finished the last day of recording, uh, Kim and I were just hanging out, just shooting the breeze, and Kim said, I'd, uh, I'd really like to uh, write some songs for Fogcat. I said, well, that'd be great. The only trouble is you have to play on them. And he said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he did. He sent, he sent me four songs, just like him singing, playing, uh, I think, so like a click track there was no band on there unfortunately um he couldn't play on those songs he uh, passed away just over a year ago last december previous december and uh it was, it was a bit it was a bit tough but um i think we did a good job on them but the really exciting thing for me anyway was that there was that connection again you know kim and i had known each grown up together almost uh you know kim was kim was only like 18 or 19 when i joined the band savoy brown so uh this sort of like completed the circle i think to a large degree and um i think he would have been pleased with it i said i loved all the songs he wrote There's, we got one that we didn't put on the record but uh, that'll probably go on the next record that kim wrote yeah well the, the opening track she's a little bit of everything that was what one of the great, songs what a great tune <laughs> you like it yeah i like it i like it <laughs> that, that was uh that was co-written with kim um we claim that it was written about his wife um that sort of embarrasses us so we say every time we played the song <laughs> <laughs> which is every night that's part that's become part of the set yeah and then one of the other ones that you uh, wrote with him was time slips away which I thought was a poignant. Yeah, uh, Kim wrote that. I think I know when when he knew he was uh, he was about to pass, and uh, I guess thinking about it, the fact that he wrote such a personal song and gave it, you know, to us to uh, play on, I think, says something about you know how he felt about the band and our relationship. Um, we're not playing that live. Uh, because when we played it, it was um, it took us a while, uh, Scott and I, to sort of figure out how we wanted to play it. But when once we decide, once we did, it's very lean, very open. It's all about you know the song, um, you know it was that that was it. It's Kim talking about uh, dealing with it, and I think he. Uh, he did. Unfortunately, I couldn't see him uh, because there was there was still the COVID thing. Um, they wouldn't let other anybody anybody in the hospital. But um, we had a, a long and uh, full uh, relationship. You know, one of the really cool things that I know about my relationship with Kim after after we left the band, we didn't see each other for about five or six years. You know they got busy and so did we but we were always it was whenever we saw each other it was it was very we were comfortable in each other's uh it was kim was really well read in fact and, and i love to read as well and it was always easy we would sit down just talk and it was uh it was always a joyous situation anytime we met and playing together we would laugh a lot and it was um yeah uh my relationship with with kim and with savoy brown is is very important to me it was like um a huge part of my life and uh yeah it's a shame he didn't get to play on on the record but he he would put out a new record every year and, and write you know 12 or 14 songs they hate people like that <laughs> <laughs> those talented productive yeah, people oh. yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was, he was a great, and I think probably one of the greatest blues guitar players that come out of England anyway. Yeah. Well, yeah. tell me this. You you mentioned your uh, love of reading. 
what was the last book you read that really enthralled you? Oh, The Moth. There's actually my oldest daughter uh, who lives in England with my granddaughter. Um, she runs a, uh, a large bookstore there. So uh, she, she's an avid reader, as she knows I am. And she always sends me really cool books for my birthdays or Christmas. I mean, it's a really good daughter. Very, very good. Anyway, the she bought me is a bunch of short stories written by people who perform live and they record it and then they just edit it and, and put it uh just clear up any anything and it's people talking about the most personal maybe joyous maybe sad in between uh, but it's something that people have actually gone through and it's an incredible book i re i'd reckon um there's two of them there's actually three books i haven't got the third one yet they're called the moth and and it's an in really interesting way where they started i think there was a couple of people down in Georgia. They would have um, evenings talking about um, life. And, uh, yeah, the moth. I'd recommend it to every everybody and anybody. When people, you're reading stories about people that are just opening up and, and, and telling, giving their, telling their story. And it and it's, it's a beautiful thing. There's stuff that makes you laugh. There's stuff that makes you cry, and there's stuff that's so poignant. Poignant, you go, "Wow!" Um, yeah, the moth. Um, I've gone on about it, and that's because I recommend it to the whole world to read stuff like that. There's too much crap going on in the world. Um, I think people, if people got you know a little bit more real and talk to each other a bit more, you know, we're all related whether we like it or not. Oh dear, I'm getting on a soapbox now, aren't I? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not wrong. Uh, no, no. <laughs> not from my we're, perspective. All, we're all related, so we better get start getting on with each other. It's important. It's a good idea to have different points of view. That's how you get things done. But come on. Anyway, all right. I'm sorry. I digress. <laughs> well, on that note, let's get back to the record. Sonic okay. Mojo out good now. Uh, the track, I don't appreciate you. You're kind of an 80s vibe going <laughs> with that one. Yeah. Um, that was um I, 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 wrote, I wrote that um it was actually written i can say this now because i don't care yes i do care actually it was written by an ex-manager who's a real scumbag uh <laughs> stole from an, everybody um used to be a friend but then for some reason went another the other way but i've heard lots of things with bands complaining about managers doing stuff like that anyway uh it was written about him uh scott got a hold of it and he's also been through the mill with a few people and he changed some of the lyrics but it's about scott describes it and i think rather poignantly as the uh, 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 uh most the nicest fu song ever written um the politest fu song ever written it's you know the you know it's um i don't appreciate you and and like i i think when i stuck i came up with that line and started writing it, it was like it was kind of a comedy because <laughs> you know sometimes you i mean you have to laugh at the dark stuff or cry so i'm laughing and writing these lyrics about how i don't appreciate you i don't appreciate it. and then scott of course got a hold of it and he put his magic on it and uh he really, he really pulled it off. And at the time, Scott was, Scott um, is a co-owner of a record store down in Columbia, Tennessee, and he's a big vinyl fan. Um, he's only 57, 58, somewhere around there. So he didn't get to sort of go through the punk thing and hear it, you know, which is basically rock and roll anyway. Uh, just played a little bit faster and uh, with a bit more snot dribbling down your nose. Oh, I'm sorry. You can edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> it's the truth. <laughs> uh, anyway, Scott's listening to uh, the Pistols, and, and uh, you know, because he's getting the, the this vinyl in, and uh, he was, and he just, and like we're sitting there, like, and, and like, I, I, I played a drum track, and he said, yeah, "Let's do that." And at the time, I'd um, 
I had I needed to have su surgery on my shoulder because I uh, torn the shoulder muscle. It was drooping down. In fact, I used to tape it up. And uh, I said, well, I've only got one one more take on this song left in me because we, we did the first one where we said, this is the arrangement. And it was just, that's it. And uh, and I played it and it's really, really fast and it got really all these fast single stroke rolls in it. But it was very punky, which I think the sort of song lent itself to, but we didn't use the um, expletives. Um, it was the, the most polite you song ever written i think yeah thank you for uh uh did you say tom petty no you said an 80s kind of thing right yeah it had, it had that it had, I was, an 80s, had, yeah. 80s. Uh, tom petty I too, loved, too. tom petty is great i loved him you know he wrote a song about lonesome dave mm -hmm. did you know that i thought that was so cool i never met tom petty but um i saw them uh, three or four times great band wonderful songs funny songs so mm -hmm. now there's something i had a sense of humor um yeah it was a sad day when we lost him yeah but, um yeah he brought a lot of joy to the world uh, and he was it always shows he was always funny I, I don't know if you've ever listened to um he's on sirius xm uh, mm -hmm. and they play, a, they play a bunch of his uh live recordings and like they're really really good he must have carried like uh his own studio around but um the quality of the live and uh the way the way the band plays he had a great band yeah oh mike mike campbell I love him. a phenomenal guitar player yeah yes and a, and a great producer too what was his name mike campbell well it was a guitar player yeah was he the producer as well uh, he doesn't. But on uh, he does production. Uh, he he's worked did a, a phenomenal album with Marty Stewart. Yeah. But yeah. It he's you know sonically clean. Yeah. You know, but it, it's he captures the moment. Yeah, I love the way he plays. He's got a very interesting way of playing as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you're right. There's 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 always in his guitar solos like there's some really cool stuff he would play like you know like that. But um, his picking is is fantastic. It's, it's, yeah, Mike Campbell, great guitar player. There's so many great guitar players out there. I mean, like, occasionally you see things like, who's the world's best guitar player? What a stupid question. <laughs> <laughs> Segovia. <laughs> <laughs> Let's um, pull. Uh, well, talk, 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 talk about guitar players. You yeah, cover BB right. uh, King's right. She's Dynamite. Oh. Yeah, uh, again, that was um, down to Scott Hole. Um, he and I were just playing in the studio. Brian happened to press the record button. And that was it, just one take. Um, uh, and, then I, and then I think Brian, I, I don't even know, I think actually Brian played bass on that. Um, but a lot of, uh, certainly all the songs are, are written by other people. Uh, they all came from, just jamming and you know we go well that was fun let's put it on the record um that's one of the joys of having your own studio i knew actually when uh <clears throat> after lonesome dave passed the only way this band was gonna like survive is if we made music you know otherwise we'd just be doing which is fine to doing you know folk hat songs from the previous what nine or ten albums that we've done but you have to, musicians have to, you know, it's, it's that creative juice that gives you everything. You know, that that's our energy. Um, and that, that's the fun part, you know, being creative. I mean, playing live is like the best. Uh, as I said earlier, you know, people clap and cheer for you when you finish your work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, it's... Uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's a great way to earn a living. Um, I'm one of those fortunate for few in the world that really enjoy it. It's a wonderful thing. Yeah, it is. I'll tell you what, Roger. On that note, we're uh, coming to the uh, end of our hour here. Is there anything that we you know didn't touch on that you want to make sure that we do? Um, you know, uh, uh, uh Cat. Facebook, find, folk at this, uh, if 
you can mention those, that would be great. No, we, we've had the, the website and all the different social media platforms scrolling across the screen at various times. And we have? Uh, all right. So, hey, we got, we got to drive traffic to you. Yeah, you know, um, that was um, interesting. I mean, uh, feels like I've known you for ages. <laughs> and likewise. Yeah, so hope, you. hopefully you guys come through Chicago. Uh, we, we should be there. Uh, we always go through there at least once a year. But um, get in touch with Rose and or Linda. Uh, Rose is our assistant. And uh, come and see us. Will do. And uh, Mike is uh our road manager you'll get in touch with him mike arcello okay all right pleasure talking to you likewise well roger with that we will wrap this episode of music night of the majestic up thank you for being here everybody thanks for watching have a good night thank you bye this has been music night at the majestic with michael boswell if you enjoyed this edition of Music Night at the Majestic, follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and at musicnight.net. Music Night at the Majestic is a copyright production of Starliner Media. Any use of the accounts and descriptions of this program, its audio or visual content, without the express written consent of Starliner Media, is prohibited. Thank you for joining us this evening. We'll see you next time for Music Night at the Majestic. This is your announcer speaking.